Good morning, Manifest. I am so glad that you guys could all join us this morning. Um, we're going to do things a little bit different this morning. I have zero script. I don't know where I'm going with this. But what I wanted to say was Heidi and I, my lovely wife here, uh, just recently celebrated our 19th anniversary. Um, I saw a post that Rob and Suzanne just celebrated their anniversary, so congratulations to them. And I'd like to try something. If you'd like to, uh, post in the comments when your anniversary is and how many years you've been married so that we can say congratulations because marriage is a wonderful uh, place to be. So Heidi and I, um, like I said, we celebrated our 19th anniversary, but it's a little different for us because we kind of grew up as family friends. And so um, I don't really know a time where I didn't know Heidi. It's hard to say when people ask us, oh, how did you meet? It's kind of a funny story because we didn't really meet. We just always knew each other. And so today we thought it would be funny to try to stump each other, asking questions about ourselves that maybe the other person doesn't know. So we've got nine or 10 questions each. Neither of us know what they are. And um, we're just going to have a little bit of fun with it. We hope that they're um, not too embarrassing, but we'll see. So Heidi, who wants to start? I'll start. Okay, great. All right, Brad. Okay. Bird. Here we go. When and where did I accept Jesus as my savior? Oh, wow. I should know this. Um, <laughs> when and where? I'm going to say you were in about grade three E-free church at some like vacation Bible school. No. Oh, I'm wrong. I was six years old in the kitchen in Brooks with my mom. Wow. <clears throat> Good answer. All right. Okay. How many boxing fights did I get into? Get into? Like how many boxing fights did I have in my boxing career? Career, career if you want to call it a career. <laughs> it was. <laughs> uh, you have a tattoo to prove it? Yes. Thirty. Ooh, I don't know exactly, but it was around twenty-five to thirty. So I would, I would give you your one nothing for Heidi. Yes. Have I been baptized? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I knew her. Um, yes. Yes, I. Lake have. Newell. No. No. Varsity Bible Church. Oh yeah, I do remember that. Me too, actually. Yeah. That's not one of my questions. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you got better questions than I do. Who is my favorite music artist or group? I'm going to say that because I'm going to make it hard. Elton John. Oh, got me. Am I, am I like an open book? Yeah. Don't read my questions. All right. It's two nothing for Heidi if anybody's counting. <laughs> How many musical instruments have I learned to play? Probably the piano, trumpet. Does recorder count? No. Okay. Um, guitar, bass. Does the guitar and bass are two different ones? Yes. I'm gonna say those four. I said three, trumpet, piano, and bass. Okay. I can play a few card chords on. Guitar is the same, okay, okay. All right. Do you, are you gonna give me that one? Yeah. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> All right, where were we? the first time that we kissed. In your parents' kitchen in Brooks. I don't know if it was the kitchen, but it was at my parents' house. It was I think we above the, the, stair room. the stairs, the kitchen, and then the stairs going into the basement, like right there. Or it was yeah, on maybe. the couch. I thought it was on the couch. In the sunken floor. Yeah, yeah. 1990. You're three for three. I'll give you three for three. Okay. Okay, two truths and a lie. Oh no, okay. I've cliff jumped. I've been to Juneau, Alaska. Uh, now think of your lie. <laughs> nope. I thought I put this, okay. <laughs> I've cliff jumped. Yes. I've been to Juneau, Alaska. Yeah. I, have, I have had several Club Monaco sweatshirts. 
I want to say they're all true, but I, I know you've cliff jumped because you told me about that one. Um, and I thought you went to Juneau, Alaska, but who hadn't, ha who doesn't, growing up when we grew up, who didn't have a Club Monaco shirt, put your hand up. Everybody had a Club Monaco shirt. So I'm going to say Juneau, Alaska is not true. I've cliff jumped. I've been to Juneau, Alaska. And I only had one. One. Club on oh, come on. Okay. What is, what's the book that I hid your ring in? Of Mice and Men. I didn't even finish the question. Who's it by? Yes, you're right. It's of Mice and Men. I hid the engagement ring in the book of Mice and Men just before I asked Heidi to marry me because we were. We were reading it together and she would flip the page and see the engagement ring and freak out, which she did. <laughs> this guy. I said, you jerk. <laughs> I'm going to Italy, don't ask me before I leave. And then he did. Well, I had to be careful from the Italian stallions that we're gonna be wooing her. All right, next. Where's my favorite place to be? Besides Italy, I'm going to say outside, probably by some moving water in the woods, just in nature and quietness. Correct. Yes. Or the beach. Water. <laughs> All right. Question number five. What's the longest race that I've ever done? Half Ironman and Stony Plain. Yes, I actually put a different one on here, but based on just sheer distance, the half iron man would be it. Based on time, the oh, Ultra Beast yes. in Sun Peaks was right. 10, 10 and a half hours. But yeah, I'll give it to you because I said longest means distance. You got it. He is a beast. <laughs> I love this question. Okay. Why do you hate bangs? Oh, what? <laughs> Why do you hate You're bangs? You're putting me on the spot because now if anybody has bangs. Nope, why, do you, why do you hate bangs? I, <laughs> that's why, right there. Look at that. That's why. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Did I get that one right? Yep. Okay. <laughs> How many weddings have I been the MC oh, man. at? Four. Yes, I think you're right. I think it's been four. Have I you know. actually counted? Yeah. Your friend Amy, your sister Amy, my friend Raph, and Luke and Maddie's wedding, I think, with Matt. I think that's the four I've been MC at. Yes. Okay. Two truths and a lie. Okay, I'm ready. I worked at a summer camp in California. Okay. I've had to poop in several <laughs> weird places. <laughs> You're saying this in front of live television. I don't care. I love touching flour. Um, that one's easy. She hates flour. Absolutely hates touching flour, can't touch it. I have to do <laughs> the touching flour when she bakes anything. I love that you still bake. True, that's true. So yes, that one is true. Go rewind and figure out what the two true ones were because they're funny. Okay, um, what was my nickname when I was little? Bradley Adley Poop Poop. Yeah, that was it. Bradley Adley Poop Poop. Got it. Your question. How come you're so hot? <laughs> how do I, how do I, because I have, oh, look at my hair. That's why, that's why. Look at this mop. <laughs> okay. Uh, have I broken any bones? And if so, how many? Yes, you have. Okay, that's correct. Two, your nose and your wrist. Oh, yeah. Your nose maybe twice. Wow, who knows? <laughs> who knows? Ah, do that thing I can't do. <laughs> okay, go. This is a doozy. Okay. Who is my mom's cousin's wife once removed? Say that again. <laughs> who is my mom's cousin's wife once removed? Your mom's cousin's wife? What? No. Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> I have no idea. If you said anyone around the Brooks area. Oh, I would get it right. Probably. Yeah. Except for the Henderson. Yes. That'd be weird. Okay. Okay. Um, here's a good one. What 
crappy hotel did we stay at on our anniversary because our plans had to change when we were driving through the states. Marco! Polo! Marco Polo in, yeah. We're cheap. We we had nowhere to stay. It was like 11 o'clock at night and we're like, hey, here's a hotel. We went in. Was that in it, Seattle? I think so, and it was bad. Don't stay there. Not recommended, not even one star. Okay. Yeah, last question for me. Okay. What did I dress up as for our second Halloween poker tournament? Second? Trelawney from Harry Potter? I have no idea actually. What I even dress up? All right. Name three of my best friends while I was growing up. Mike Vanderdeen. Yeah. Malcolm. I'll give you that one. Durgin. Yeah, I'll give you that one. Well, what age? Gr Bo Walker. There you go, that's three of them. What about that? Nobody here knows them anyways. If you're watching those three people, welcome to Manifest. That's our questions. Um, we don't know who won or who lost. We just, <laughs> we had fun reminiscing. And we wanna say to anybody who's married out there, try this. It's, it was more fun than I thought it was gonna be. Um, 10 questions and see how well you know each other and see how much you love each other. So with that being said, I think our time is almost up. Welcome, Welcome to, to Manifest. Manifest. Hey Manifest Kids, it's Miss Shauna. How are you guys doing? Well, fall is definitely here. There's so many beautiful leaves on the ground, isn't there? I thought we would dive right into Esther today. It just gets more interesting every week, doesn't it? So this week, we're looking at chapter five. So that means we've read five chapters of Esther. Isn't that just amazing? And I'm, we are so proud of you for, who's, for, for reading it. So Esther five is really interesting, as all the chapters are. But in this chapter, just to put a highlight on it, um, Esther knows that she needs to be obedient. She knows that she, she needs to stand up for her people and she knows what could happen if she does it. So she's fasting, she's prayed, and she goes in front of the king. And as we read, we realize the king grants her his audience. He grants her the visit to come and talk to him, which is incredible. After that, there's an invitation to a banquet that Esther has for him and for Haman. Haman's the bad guy, by the way, if you haven't read it yet and you're just jumping in. After the banquet, the first banquet, the king asks, has already asked her twice, I will give you anything, even up to half the kingdom. And Esther invites him to a second banquet the next day. Now, I'm literally skimming over the, the book, of, of, or sorry, the chapter of chapter five. In the very end, as Haman's walking by Mordecai after the first banquet and sees Mordecai not bowing down, not doing anything, Haman gets mad again. So it's not good enough for the Jews to be literally taken out of existence in a year. He wants something to happen to Mordecai. So he gets some really bad advice, which is to build some gallows overnight and have Mordecai killed. And that's how the chapter ends. So there's a lot that happens in chapter five. But I really wanted to touch on two things. First, the bravery of Esther. It takes incredible bravery to follow through on things that we know that God wants us to do during scary situations. Maybe God wants you to share about him with a friend who doesn't know Jesus. Maybe he needs you to, he wants you to go and apologize for something. Whatever it is, sometimes when God wants us to do something, it's not always easy, but it's rewarding and being obedient. And there's a blessing in it. There's always a blessing in it. And so Esther had to be brave and choose to be brave when she was choosing to be obedient. Another thing I want to point out here is we notice again that God's name isn't used in this chapter. And yet there's such miraculous God moments in this that only could have been orchestrated 
or created by him. For example, the biggest one, the king didn't have to have and be okay with Queen Esther coming into the palace to talk to him. In fact, the expectation is that it wouldn't go well. And yet, without any reason, he hands out his scepter and allows her to come and touch it. And not only that, says, whatever you want, Queen Esther, up to half my kingdom. That's a God moment. That's a God orchestrated, God planned event. Pretty incredible. And again, when he comes with Haman, who we all know is the bad guy in this story, and they go to the banquet, and again, the king says, anything you want, Queen Esther, up to half my kingdom. And Esther replied, this is my request and deepest wish. If I have found favor with the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my request and do what I ask, please come with Haman tomorrow to the banquet I will prepare for you. Then I will explain what this is all about. So we know God's working here. We also know that there's evil trying to work as well. And next week, I think we're going to learn some more very interesting things. But we're also going to see God's amazing work in this story. I love it when God takes people that don't even know him and works and works in their life and works and does things that helps them see him in a beautiful way. So lots of information, lots of questions to take away from. I hope you guys have a fantastic week. I can't wait to read chapter six. I don't know about you guys. Thank you so much for hanging out with Manifest Kids this morning. Take care, guys. Talk to you soon. Well, good morning and hello to our online Manifest family. We've been on a huge journey so far into what it means to live in the Spirit, to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we've learned some amazing things to begin with. I just want to review a few of those concepts because we're going to build on those today. We're going to, we're going to round those out today. What I'm trying to do is build a foundation that will last your entire life built on the theology that is solid from the scriptures. And so let's review what we've learned so far, okay? All right, first thing we've learned is that Christianity is actually nothing less than the life of Christ flowing through the sons and daughters of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Christian life itself is about the Holy Spirit bringing to us, uh, uh, activating in us the work of Jesus on the cross his resurrection, his triumph over the powers, our death to sin, life to God, all of that stuff comes out in the power of the Holy Spirit. Number two, if we are in Christ, we have the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to be in Christ. But when we are baptized or filled with the Spirit, the Spirit has us. So part of what we're learning on this journey is that there's a difference between having the Holy Spirit and experiencing the full power of the Holy Spirit. We experience the full power of the Spirit when the Spirit of God has us, owns us. We are living in submission to Him. Which brought us to our third lesson, which was that tr not trusting the Holy Spirit is not trusting Jesus. Why? Because the Spirit-led life is the Christian life. Jesus said, it's better that I go away, he said, because then I'll send him, I'll send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit to you. And so we need to learn to trust the Holy Spirit, even though he could seem kind of mysterious at times and we're not sure what's going to happen if we yield to him and all of that. Jesus trusted him. Why? Because he's God, right? And so we need to learn to trust him. And then we also learned that by grace through faith is the how of heaven. In other words, we don't earn our intimacy with Jesus. We don't earn the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. That's a gift that's given to us. But we need faith to receive it, right? By grace through faith is the how of heaven. Faith can't achieve grace, but it's necessary to receive it. 
And then last week we learned that it's tempting to try to push our lives forward, but actually the first step into spirit-filled living is refusing to push our life forward in our own strength, in our own strength. All right, so now you may have noticed throughout the course of this series so far that I've been pulling verses from Old Testament, New Testament, different books of the Bible, and you may have been wondering, is this just sort of cobbled together you know, from different places. Like, is there anywhere in the Bible that actually just teaches this stuff? And the answer is yes. And the solution to the answer to your question is going on a road trip. And we're going to head into Rome today, but we're not going to visit the Colosseum or, you know, the museums or the Vatican or anything like that. What we're going to do is we're going to walk through the book of Romans today, the first chapters, the first eight chapters, sorry. And I'm going to show you how the first eight chapters of the book of Romans lay out the gospel in stunning detail and also culminate in the power of the Holy Spirit being released in our lives. How many of you are familiar with the Romans road? Romans road, you ever learned that path to evangelism, right? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord right? And if we call on the name of the Lord, we will be saved. This, this Romans road, the interesting thing about it is it mit, misses an entire huge section of the Holy Spirit. It kind of ignores the fact that the Christian life itself is the Spirit-filled life. But the, but the book of Romans itself underscores this. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to read every verse from every chapter. I'm going to do kind of like a, a parachute into every chapter. I'm going to walk through the first eight chapters. While I'm doing that, I'm going to build a picture behind me so that you can see visually by focusing on key words, key concepts, what it means to live in our own strength or live in the power of the Spirit. So that's that's what we're going to unpack in the book of Romans. I'm so excited to do this. And um, what, I, what I'm going to do in our in-person gathering, this, this, I've got boxes, not just sticky notes, but I've got boxes and kids are going to pile up different things. So in your mind, I want you to build this picture. In your mind, I want you to start to observe what you're seeing and what's developing and make your own conclusions as well about what the... Um, the gospel says and what the gospel's all about. All right. So Lord Jesus, would you please fill me now? Would you move through me and help me to do justice to your word in the name of Jesus? Amen. You ready for the road trip? Romans road, the way it's intended to be done, moving through every chapter of the book of Romans. So how I would summarize the, the first chapter of Romans is in verse 16 and 17. So I'm just going to read that to you and it'll be on the screen there uh, below. There's so much scripture that if I just put the blank screen on, you'd never see me. So <laughs> I'm going to have it at the bottom of the screen so you can read along with me. So as you can see there, we have this incredible section of scripture where Paul says the gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. And in the gospel, a righteousness or the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness from God, some translations say, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Okay, so we're going to start building our picture here. I've got these, these big sticky notes. So what we've got is, first of all, we've got the concept of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. So we're going to, this entire book is about good news. All right. So if you're not a, a church person, you've never heard the Christian faith laid out, this is going to be really instructive for you. And he says that the gospel is the power of God. So over here, we have the gospel, we have the power of God. But what does the power of God do? It brings salvation. The power of God. The gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to... Uh, oh, right. That brings salvation to everyone who believes... In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Not our righteousness, but the righteousness of God. And how does it come? It's a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Through and through, this gospel is about faith. So that's what the, the first chapter of Romans is about. 
I hope that kind of gives you an interesting look. We have this word righteousness. We've got the power of God. We've got salvation going on. Salvation means deliverance. It means wholeness. It means rescue. It means being set free from what's been binding us. And the word righteousness is an interesting one. The word righteousness literally means, and you can see it in the word, to be set right. So we have a problem before. We're going to talk about the problem over here. But our problem is that we're not right. We're not right in the head. We're not right in any, we're not right with ourselves. We're not right with God, right? We're out of right relationship with each other. We're kind of in a, in a discordant relationship with the world. We're not right. We are broken. And righteousness, and especially the righteousness of God, means that we will somehow, by faith, be saved by being set right. Being set right with God, through the power of God, in the gospel. Okay, so this is how this is going to go. Now, we move to the next part of chapter 1 in, in Romans. I'm having fun, can you tell? The next part of the, the book of Romans talks about our problem. So this is what the book of Romans is going to unpack. He's already, he set out his mission statement. This is what the book of Romans is going to do. It's going to show you how the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And it's about the righteousness of God being revealed. Okay. On the other hand, (laughs) the wrath of God is being revealed. So here I'm going to put this sticky note up. The wrath of God is being revealed. So we have wrath on the other side from heaven. So just like this is the power of God. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images to to be made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. In other words, we've exchanged the glory of God for something that we have made. And as a result, we're under this wrath. So that's the first word. And we continue in the first chapter. This is a thick chapter. Don't you agree? Therefore, God gave them over. Who's them? The ones who are under his wrath. Why? Because they exchanged the glory of God for something that they are trying to make and that they're worshiping. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts. So now we've got this concept of sinful desires somehow being part of this wrath picture. And God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they might do what they ought not to, what ought not to be done. And they've become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. So there's, there's the the bottom line is that this way of life, separate from the gospel, is a way of depravity where we are indulging our own sinful desires because we've exchanged the glory of God for something we're trying to do on our own. And as a result, we're under God's wrath. That's just the first chapter. Okay, so chapter two. You ready? Chapter two. By the way, at the end, all of this will be on the screen. Take a screenshot and you've got the book of Romans in a nutshell. So chapter two, we read that God is now going to respond to this situation, our sinful rebellion and all of that. He says, because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you're storing up, there it is that word again, wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they've done. So this now we're finding is a way of judgment. Okay, and it says that God's judgment is righteous. In other words, he's not going to give you, he's not going to repay you according to what you haven't done. It's according to what you have done. So at this point in the book of Romans, I'm not going to get into um, the, there's a specific message here for Jews in particular, Jews versus Gentiles. You'll hear that referred to a little bit. I'm going to kind of skip that track and talk about us in general. But here's a space where that he knows, Paul knows his Jewish writers are going to go, hey, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. You can't paint us with the same brush. We're, we're God's people. <laughs> and, and in that same way, you might think, well, I grew up in church. Like, uh, I've been a Christian my whole life, you know. So how can this kind of apply to me? Well, he says, if you rely on the law, 
and boast in God, if you're convinced that you're a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, then the law being the list of, you know, what's right and wrong. When you look at the world today, you know, and you're like, oh, those people are just so wicked. They're so evil, but I... You know, if that's how you are, if you're relying on the law, this way of the law, he's saying, you got some issues. If that's, if that's what you're kind of appealing to, that, that you're more moral than these other people, we've got issues. This is where we get to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. He says, if that's, if that's what you're thinking... At least I'm better than the other guy. Like, according to the law, the rules, the Ten Commandments, maybe the, the list of morals that I hold so dear, I'm better than these other people. Surely I am not in the same category. And then the Apostle Paul says, um, actually, Jews and Gentiles alike are all alike under the power of sin. So now we have this new word in here called sin, and it's contrasted with the power of God. We have the power of God at work in this way of life, and we've got the power of sin activated in this way of life. It says there's no one righteous. So when you're trying to obey the rules, when you're trying to do it yourself, when you've exchanged God's solution for your own solution, there's nobody that measures up. Everybody falls short. There's no one righteous, not even one. So this, this, nobody's right. Nobody. Only, this is the righteousness of God. Nobody over here is righteous. None of us are. Not even one, it says. There's no one who understands. Nobody gets it. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. It may seem kind of harsh, but the end, at the end of the day, then we read that every mouth over here, Every mouth will be silenced. Everybody who's got their excuse and trying to justify themselves over here will realize they have no justification. God is justified in his judgment, but we've got a justification problem. We can't justify our behavior. We can't justify how far we've fallen. We are not justified. God is justified in his judgment. The whole world will be held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we just become conscious of our sin. I keep standing on my mic here. So I'm going to put this here, the works of the law. So nobody, by trying to be a good person, will actually work it out so that they're they're righteous in God's sight. Nobody will. So nobody's justified. God is justified in his judgment. But we are not justified to go, actually, God, if you'll see Article 7, verse 8. Like, nothing like that works with God. Okay, so this is our situation. It is not looking good. So then what do we do, right? Is is God saying, well, it's okay, you're just, you're screwed. Like, it's just, good luck. No, at the end here, we read, at the end of chapter 3, we read that, but now, in this picture... Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. The righteousness of God, apart from the law. That's this way of life, trying to measure up. This is apart from the law. The righteousness of God has been made known, given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So now we've got Jesus Christ is now the object of our faith. Through, to everyone who b- believes and are justified, look at that, justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Grace through faith in Christ. We are justified. So this is crazy. Jesus has done for us what we can't do for ourselves. There is a justification for you available so that God's judgment is still just, but you are justified through Jesus Christ and his work, 
his perfection because we all fall short, but he lived the perfect life we could never live, extends to us God's righteousness as a gift of grace so that when God looks at us, the justification isn't that we've performed well. Our justification is that we put our faith in Jesus. Kaboom. And that is good news. That is the power of God for salvation. Oh, can you see it? So good. Moving to chapter four. Are you with me still? If you're with me, mention it in the comments. Okay, so now, now the Jews in the room, as, as Paul is mentioning this stuff in his letter, they're going, okay, but I thought the law was a big deal. I thought that we we're supposed to try to be good people because that's the impression that some of them had come to. And in chapter four, Paul essentially goes, no, it's always been about faith. It's never actually been about works. I guess there was a law and the law was given by God and technically it was good. But this is, this is you've, got, you've come to the wrong conclusion about this. Okay, so he tries to set them straight. He talks about Abraham. He says, what then shall we say that Abraham discovered in this matter? And the reason he brings up Abraham is Abraham is the father of faith. He's one of the, the patriarchs of the Old Testament, the one to whom the promise came. And he was the beginning of this entire picture, right, of the Jews becoming God's people. It started with Abraham, the guy who taught us how to live by faith. And he, says, he says, what then shall we say that Abraham discovered in this matter? But what matter? This thing about, should I just try to be a good person according to works? And are you sure that I'm really under judgment versus faith? And, and all of that stuff. He says, well, what does the scripture say? And every good Jew would have been able to go, uh, and they would have called to mind. Abraham, what did he discover? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. He used faith and it was credited to him as righteousness. And then a, verse, a couple of verses later, God credits righteousness apart from works. But I thought righteousness was being a good person. No, righteousness is being set right according to God's holy standard. And all of us fall short. None of us will be justified by our works of the law. And so God in the Old Testament took faith in kind of exchange for, as currency, the equivalent of good works. That's what it says. God credits righteousness apart from works. He's like, you're, you're never going to do it here. You're never going to measure up. So if you just trust me, I will credit it to your account. And you'll be justified. You'll be declared righteous, even though you're not. Now, you might think that's a little strange, and it is, but that's because God was working on something else. Where he was working on the fact that Jesus' perfect, per, uh, perfect life, his righteousness expressed on our behalf, dying for us on the cross, reconciling us to the, to the Father, atoning for our sins, paying for all that, th that he was counting on that work being imputed to us so that we could be justified by a gift of his grace. So what Abraham experienced was kind of a placeholder until Jesus got there. So then we have to ask, okay, if Jesus has done the work and I put my faith in him and I'm justified and, and all that, what, what happens as a result? And this is what chapter five does. It's crazy. So look at this. Therefore, since we have been justified, there's that word, justified through faith, right? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So now we're not under wrath. We're not in conflict with God because we keep falling short. We're actually at peace with God because Jesus has made us that way because <laughs> he's done the work to bridge us to God, right? And through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. I'm going to put this word here for now. I'm going to come back to this in a little bit. So notice the, the phrasing. We have access by faith to this grace. Where is it? There, it's the grace in which we now stand. It doesn't necessarily mean we've gone for it yet. So now we've got this potential. We, Jesus has done all this work for us. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to take a drink. 
Jesus has done this work for us, but it's not an automatic. We have access to all of this by faith, but it doesn't mean we're taking advantage of all this by faith. And the reason we're going to see that is because it's possible to have put our faith in Christ and then forget about all of this stuff and still try to make God happy over here. Okay, so he's going to keep going. We have access by faith. And then it says we hope in the, or be boast in the hope of the glory of God. So now we've got hope and glory, the glory of God. Remember that we all fall short of God's glory. We all fall short of God's glory. And, and now, right, now we've got hope. We've got hope for the glory of God all of a sudden. And hope doesn't put us to shame because God's love has been poured out in our hearts. We're living in the love of God. How is it poured out in our hearts? By the Holy Spirit, whom Christ has given us. Do you see how this is stacking up to be a completely different way of life? Now, it, Romans 5 just keeps going and going and going. Look at these benefits. God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were still over here, Christ died for us. And if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. So we now celebrate this reconciliation with God. Again, we've been made right with God. We're reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved through his life. Can I just, can we just praise God for that? That's incredible. What an incredible gift. Thank you, Jesus, for the work you've done for us so that we don't have to strive our entire lives living in this futility that we can never measure up to, knowing that we're kind of under this wrath always because we just keep failing and failing and failing. And, and we know that we're under your judgment because we're never going to like measure up. We keep struggling with the power of sin and we know that at our core we're depraved and we need a rescue. So good. In contrast, right? Sin entered the world through one man. That's Adam talking about the story of the Bible. And death through sin. So this picture just keeps getting worse, right? And in this way, death came to all people because all sinned and judgment followed one sin. So the judgment is on us and brought condemnation. But the gift of grace followed many trespasses and brought justification. Boom. And that's just chapter five. In chapter 6, the Apostle Paul goes deeper. He goes deeper into what does this mean? How exactly does faith in Christ Jesus set me free? How come I'm justified by grace? How does that even work? And he says, well, all of us who were baptized into Christ, plunged into Christ as we put our faith in Christ, were baptized into his death. And we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So what Jesus came perfectly righteous though he was, he came and lived in our sin. Now, he didn't sin himself, but he lived in our sinful world and he took upon himself the weight of this entire way of life, every sin we've ever committed, our, our, the condemnation and judgment we deserve, all of that he took, take, took upon himself. And at, when he died on that cross, he took the punishment and power of this and ended it by dying, because when you die, you're free from sin. How do you tempt a corpse? 
then, though, he didn't stay dead. He rose from the power of, of death, right? He resurrected from the grave, defeating the power of sin. And this entire failed system, the power of the enemy, rose from the grave. And now we have this hope of glory because he accomplished for us what we could never accomplish ourselves. We read that the death Christ died... He died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. And in the same way, count, reckon, uh, you know, fix your eyes on, determine in your mind that this is true. Count yourselves dead to sin because you have died to this and you're now alive to this. He says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, and sin shall no longer be your master, because you're not under the law, but you're under grace. Praise Jesus. So this is the theological work of the, of the book of Romans, chapters uh, 1 to 6. In chapter 7, he takes an interesting approach. It's like he's saying, okay, this is, this is the theology this, these are the concepts, um, and we have access to all of this. But he says, you, you and I both know that this isn't always how life plays out. And that as true as this might be, we end up living over here. And we end up living this failure kind of centric life where we're constantly trying to measure up and validate and justify ourselves and our own existence and prove ourselves and pay for our sins through good works and trying to suck up to God and please people in this endless cycle of trying to come out from under condemnation in our lives and feel like we're enough and all of this stuff. So then he says in chapter seven, he says, I, I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do I do not do, but what I hate, I do. <laughs> I don't do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep doing. I'm a mess. I'm a mess. I just, I don't, I don't understand. I'm leaving, I'm living in this world, right? And I understand that other people can live this way because they don't know Jesus, but I know Jesus. If Jesus has done all of this for me, how come I find myself in this position where I, I don't ever seem to live here? How come I keep choosing this over this? Can you relate to that question? It go, comes back to this word, access. We have access to the grace. We have access to the work that Jesus provided. Now, but he says, what a wretched man I am. I'm a mess. He says, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. And, but at this point, you're going, but Jesus already did this, what he's going to do. How does Jesus rescue me? He's already done everything he's going to do. He's already died on the cross for my sins. He's already been the, become the atoning sacrifice. He's already risen from the grave. He's already done all of this stuff. How do I get access to this life that Jesus provided for me? And here we come to Romans chapter eight, we're rounding the final corner. And the answer to this entire question, the, the uh, epitome, the uh, climax, there we go, of this entire argument comes around in, in Romans chapter eight. And what he does is he starts, where are you? He starts unpacking this. This is the answer. This is how Jesus is going to rescue us. This is how the Holy Spirit is how the, the grace of God and the peace of God and the righteousness he purchased for us, the gospel, the power of God, the hope and glory of God, the reconciliation I have with God, actually translating into intimacy with him. How do I live in the life of Christ? How do I live in the love of God? The answer is the Holy Spirit. And now I'm just going to read and comment on the first 16 verses, just in, in succession, 
in the book of Romans chapter 8 because you need to hear this in all its glory. If I had just read this to you, you wouldn't fully appreciate because you're not conscious of all these different words that are getting thrown into the argument and, and all of these words on the other side. But now that you've seen it, now that you've heard it, listen to what he says. He says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life, the spirit who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. Do you see it? For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, our sinful desire, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, like I was saying, to be a sin offering. And so he, Jesus, condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement I'm losing my place, of the law might be fully met in us. Jesus came and did this work so that the, the, the perfect requirements of the law might be perfectly met in us by faith because we don't live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. This is what it comes down to. If you and I choose to live from our own inspiration, our own strength, our own moral compass, we're living in this entire system and we'll reap the benefits of this system. But if we put our faith in Christ and trust in the power of the Spirit that He gives us, we're living a completely different life. We read, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh can't please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they don't belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, this is the final thoughts. Brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh, this old way of our own self, to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves again, right? So that you live in fear again. We could have added that word, fear and slavery, right? Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption, your reconciliation to sonship with Jesus. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father, Daddy, this intimate relationship with God. And the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, we're for his chi if we are his children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we also may share in his glory. Now, this word access is key. What it refers to is our choice. The choice each and every one of us have every day. Do we try to live it on our own? The life set on that kind of life ends in death. Or do we try to let the Spirit 
move in us and bring to life the work of Jesus Christ in us, the gospel in us, the good news based on the power of God, not my own strength. This is the life that Jesus is offering us. Now that we've got this foundation taught, at least, maybe not fully embraced and understood, but at least now that we've laid that foundation, we are ready now to talk about what it means to be led by the Spirit, because it says right here that those who are led by the Spirit are the sons and daughters of God. Amen.
Jesus Christ was raised to life. Now in Him, now in Him, we live. Thank you for joining us this morning or whenever you're watching this. We come back to this word, this choice, and I pray in the name of Jesus that you surrender, that you lay down your own self-effort, your own striving, and instead turn to the work of Christ on your behalf by the power of the Spirit. Have an amazing day.